Hello, Western States Get With the Guidelines Stroke Hospitals. I'm Dr. Mary Ann Bowman. If you are in the national part of this program, welcome back. If you're new to us, we're glad you're here. Uh, as some of you know, I am from Seattle, and I am the current president of the Western States region of the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association Board of Directors. I am so excited to welcome you to our celebration of the Get With the Guidelines Stroke Hospital honorees. Today, we are recognizing you for your relentless commitment to quality care every day, but especially during these continuing challenging times that we found ourselves in. We do have some exciting speakers during our time together. Uh, Dr. Bruce Abiagale is here to discuss health equities and disparities in stroke. And then we have the team from Queens Medical Center in Hawaii. Uh, they are going to talk about how Get With the Guidelines stroke has improved quality in their hospital. Meanwhile, you'll see all of our Western States hospitals receiving recognition featured on the scrolling photo screen. I'm really encouraging you to type in your congratulations, give shout outs in the chat box to celebrate with your colleagues. We also welcome to use you to use the hashtag relentless together on social media to share your photos, stories, and messages uh, that really talk about your relentless execution of quality patient care over this past year. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Western States Executive Vice President, Kathy Rogers. Well, hi everyone. My name is Kathy Rogers. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Western States Region for the American Heart Association. And I wanna thank everyone for being here. And thank you so much, Mary Ann. Um, we are so excited um, to be able to celebrate you, our Western States hospitals um, today. And it's so great. Um, our Western States Region consists of 10 states. And so we have everybody here across those 10 states, including um, hospitals, uh, a hospital being recognized in Guam. Um, and in Western States alone, we are celebrating uh, 900 awards um, to the hospitals across those 10 states. So again, congratulations and thank you so much for the great work that you do. When I look down at the list of all of you attending, as well as the amazing photos that I love seeing of all of you scroll by, I really think about the amazing life-saving work that you do every day. I also think about the patients, the patients that we just heard from um, on the earlier uh, session about how they really come into the hospital in such a crisis. And with the um, expertise we have today and with all of you, we know now more than ever that um, those same patients are able to go home right through the front door, returning to their families and their friends. And that is because of all of you and the dedication um, that you all have in providing the best quality stroke care. So thank you. Um, we know there, that every day there's amazing stories of passionate teamwork, examples of overcoming challenges, and leveraging the expertise and talents that you all bring that impact everyone's lives. And so this year, as you've been hearing beyond today's celebration, we want to lift up all of your stories to share throughout Stroke Awareness Month, which is May. And to do this, we invite you to share your stories on Twitter, Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag AHA Stroke Impact. Impact. You can post pictures of your team, your award, and messages about how your team is impacting stroke in your, in your community, and your photos and stories will continue to live on heart.org through the month of May, which is Stroke Month. So on behalf of all of our volunteers and staff at the American Heart Association, I want to thank each and every one of you for the great work that you do every day, and um, really from the bottom of my heart. Thank you on behalf of all of the patients that all of you are serving. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bruce Abiagale. He is gonna share his insights on health equity and stroke and will be joining us virtually. Dr. Abiagale is a professor of neurology and associate at the University of California, San Francisco. And he also serves as the chief of staff at the San Francisco Veterans Affairs Health uh, healthcare system. I'm now pleased to share his remarks. Good morning. Uh, congratulations to all the award winners. I apologize that I had to record this. I wish I could do it live. We have a joint commission survey going on and I'm not just CMO, but I'm also acting CEO. So it's quite a busy time. 
So what I hope to do is just talk a little bit about our most recent health equity and actionable disparities in stroke, understanding and problem solving, otherwise known as Heads Up Symposium, which took place uh, just before the International Stroke Conference in February in New Orleans. And so I'll just highlight a few of the key items that were covered. And so Heads Up essentially is a collaboration between the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and the American Stroke Association, um, and partner investigators around the country. And the goal of Heads Up is really to advance stroke disparity science, but also to be a forum in which we can actually mentor and even train early career investigators who have an interest in stroke disparities research. So at each Heads Up session each year, we have a poster session where these early career scholars, all of whom which win competitive travel awards to the International Stroke Conference, present their work. We also have several opportunities for them to present their grant proposals, manuscript proposals. We have a building momentum session where we have senior academic leaders answer questions about um, how to navigate the academic terrain. We have a distinguished policymaker give a talk. And so this year we had Dr. Rogers, who is the director of the National Institutes of Diabetes and Kidney Disease at the NIH, give a talk. We have uh, an award lecture, an award given to an outstanding researcher in stroke disparities. And then we have lots of opportunities for networking. So why is there a need for a symposium like Heads Up? As many of you might be aware, we've known that there have been disparities in stroke for quite a bit of time, especially when it comes to racial disparities and regional disparities. So many of you, of course, are well aware of the stroke belt, those mostly southeastern states where the uh, risk of uh, mortality from stroke is much higher than the rest of the country. And of course, the buckle of the stroke belt, Georgia and the two Carolinas, where the uh, risk of dying from a stroke is much higher than anywhere else in the country. Now, these slides focus on the issue of uh, racial disparities, which we've known about for about 60 years. And if you look to the left of the slide, you see here that if you look from just 2008 to 2018, you see that all these curves seem to be trending in the lower direction, indicating that mortality from stroke is reducing. What we do know is that over the last two decades, mortality from stroke in, all, in most high income countries, including the US, has fallen for, by about 25%. And so this just captures the last decade or so, but it's broken down into race and ethnicity. Now, high up here, as you can see, actually are non-Hispanic Blacks. And so non-Hispanic Blacks have the highest rate of dying from a stroke compared to other race ethnicities. And you can see how big the gap is. What is, what is noteworthy here is that while everybody seems to be doing better, thankfully, you still see that the gap itself, the disparity itself has not changed. And this is what you see, not just in stroke, but in many other disease entities as well. Thanks to better treatments, we're having reduced incidence of many chronic diseases and uh, uh, less mortality. But the issue is the disparity, especially by race ethnicity, hasn't really budged. And so even at this time point, black adults are still 45% more likely to die from a stroke than their non-Hispanic white counterparts. I also put here on the right, the example of Mississippi, which shows a similar pattern. Up here, you have black men, again, trending down, but still the disparity is there. And then right next to it, you have black women dying from stroke in Mississippi, and you see other race ethnicities below. This is South Carolina in the buckle of the stroke belt. And again, this looks just at hospitalizations, so not mortality, but hospitalizations. And as you can see here, these are blacks and these are whites. So a trend down in both groups, but nonetheless, still a disparity. And what is worrisome is not just the notion that the disparity um, is not budging, but that when you look out into the future, when you look at uh, key racial minority groups, that we are projecting that uh, the prevalence of stroke is likely to increase. So this disparity that we're seeing that hasn't budged is possibly going to get worse with time. And as you can see, we are projecting that 
And this was an American Stroke Association policy paper. We're projecting that uh, the prevalence of stroke is going to rise even higher in black men, um, Hispanic men, and black women. So clearly, something needs to be done. And so the issue of health inequities is a complex one, perhaps not surprisingly. There are biological and environmental interactions. But I think um, in 2022, one of the biggest areas of emphasis is the issue that while, of course, there are biological contributors to these disparities, a lot of them can be explained by contributors from the social context, either social conditions and policies or social relationships as well. And so this brings me to this term. Many of you have uh, probably heard of the social determinants of health, those conditions that we are born in, we live in, we play in, we work in, but which have influences on health outcomes. Here you can see that there are six different columns. When we tend to talk about social determinants of health, especially in the context of disparities, we largely focus on the health system, which is appropriate. But as you can see, there are several other potential areas we could also be focusing on in order to try and improve the stroke outcomes for our patients. In particular, the community and social context is very important. And potentially there could be a role for many providers to influence that area as well in order to reduce morbidity and mortality from stroke. So this is just one study that we just conducted and is being reviewed at the journal Stroke. And what we did here was to look at the um, uh, historical redlining um, in New York City um, in the 19. Uh, 30s to uh, 1960s, and or compare it to stroke prevalence, uh, contemporary stroke prevalence, 2014 to 2018 in New York City. And what we found was that you see these um, areas where the stroke prevalence is very, very high, dark, and you see the areas where the redlining score very, very high, dark, tend to overlap for the most part. In fact, we find that red lighting score was a strong predictor of stroke prevalence, even after you adjust it for a whole host of medical risk factors and even social de other social determinants of health as well. And uh, just to underscore for folks who might not be as aware of what redlining uh, was, it was, the, it was these discriminatory lending practices to neighborhoods predominantly occupied by uh, 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 racial and ethnic minorities. And so that in itself, as a potential social determinant, uh, clearly while you can't say cause and effect, there seems to be a strong relationship between contemporary stroke prevalence and uh, uh, higher redlining uh, 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 about 30 to 40 years ago. So I put in this slide just as an example because many people, when I speak to them, they say, well, we've had these disparities for so long. So Bruce, why do you think that there's any uh, cause for optimism that we might be able to either narrow these disparities in stroke or even eliminate them? So this is one prominent example that gives me cause for optimism. So this is end-stage renal disease, kidney failure. And it's really the one prominent example of a disparity being eliminated in a particular minority um, racial group. And so uh, in 1980, the incidence of end-stage renal disease was about four times higher in Native Americans compared to their non-Hispanic white counterparts. This particular graph captures the story from 1996 to 2013, when uh, certain changes were instituted in order to try and address this higher incidence of end-stage renal disease in Native Americans. And as you can see, just looking at the green curve, um, the incidence of kidney failure dropped substantially to the point that now, contemporary times, the incidence of kidney failure in Native Americans is exactly the same as it is in non-Hispanic whites. It's actually quite the same at this point, and there are even more recent data to support that. And so very, very encouraging that you had this tremendous disparity, but over time, you see that it was actually narrowed. Now, as you can see here, African-Americans up here still quite high, that disparity a little bit better, but really not much change. But really where you see the success story is this significant drop in Native Americans. 
So what did they do? So essentially what they did, there was no unique intervention, but they really focused not just on short-term outcomes as um, a, a, a healthcare system, but focused on long-term outcomes and the wellness of the entire community. They really tried to make sure that um, they didn't just rely on nephrologists and re renal nutritionists, but tried to make sure that all providers were at least savvy to some extent to be able to be competent enough to address the needs of most of these patients who were at risk for end-stage renal disease. There was a lot of community outreach and culturally tailored education by nurses and community health workers. And as you can see to the right here, this is actually the chronic care model, which posits that if you are able to combine resources and policies and stakeholders in the community with what happens in the health system, you're much more likely to have improved outcomes. As you can see here, even as an example, uh, they created this three-day case management workshop and uh, invited all health professionals, including physicians who were interested, uh, who had an interest uh, in trying to create change to, to be exposed to the workshop. And what you saw at the end of the day was increased um, prescriptions of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, greater testing, better BP control, and better glycemic control, which all clearly contributed to that uh, elimination of the disparity. But this is an important um, issue to underscore because, of course, we get with the guidelines, we've done a terrific job. You've all done a terrific job with really trying to address the issue of uh, evidence-based care in the hospital. But what happens in the community? How do we stay with the guidelines? How do we make sure that healthcare systems are partnering with the community to make sure that the great job that is done within the hospital is maintained outside of the hospital? And so this slide just underscores, again, that importance of community partnerships, that individual health is clearly closely linked to community health. And community health uh, greatly affects collective behaviors and beliefs of everyone who lives in the community. And so in order to facilitate such community partnerships, it's important to try and put together sometimes community advisory boards comprising lots of lay stakeholders who can invite, advise and inform and engage the community along with the healthcare system leaders and providers. One of the issues I'm asked a lot is, Bruce, well, I'm a physician, I prescribe medications, why would I be, how would I address the social determinants of health? Well, there's potentially an opportunity to do so. In the United Kingdom, they've really tried to um, uh, uh, emphasize this issue of social prescribing, especially for patients who have chronic medical conditions. And the whole idea here is trying to change the expectations of both patients and their providers that a drug or drugs will solve all their problems. And really trying to have providers more in tune to the notion that they can use local resources um, to try and prescribe social interventions for patients. And so this is just a schematic showing what happens. It's not just a situation of a provider referring a patient to a social worker, but really trying to um, identify with the patient, well, are there social issues that are impeding this patient's ability to comply with the regimen in the community? Having that discussion with the patient. And then, of course, referring to the social worker or the link worker and following up when you see that patient again to find out if those social issues were addressed. Again, I think this is an area that all of us, um, including myself, could do a better job and could potentially really help to really start and, and, and continue that conversation about addressing these social determinants of health. I wanted to put in uh, 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 an overview of two studies that were presented at the Heads Up conference. One is the Shake, Rattle and Roll trial uh, led by Dr. Mai Nguyen, which um, looked at uh, primary care practices in Kaiser, Oakland. Uh, they were, these were uh, practices that catered to uh, African-American patients who had high blood pressure. They were randomized to three different arms, usual care, enhanced monitoring in which they used the Kaiser blood pressure management protocol, and then culturally tailored diet and lifestyle coaching. Um, what they found very intriguingly was after 12 months post uh, intervention, blood pressure control rates were much better, significantly so, in those who received the culturally tailored diet and lifestyle coaching, which was administered by nutritionists, uh, compared to usual care. There was no difference between enhanced monitoring and usual care. So um, in this 
uh, 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 minority population with a propensity for stroke with higher blood pressure, lifestyle coaching was um, seemed to be quite, quite effective. Um, the other um, trial uh, that was also presented and discussed, which is cause for um, cautious optimism, was this New York-based study, which looked at stroke survivors this time, black and Hispanic stroke survivors with uncontrolled BP, randomized to home blood pressure telemonitoring, plus counseling, again, on the issue of lifestyle behaviors by nurses, compared to just telemonitoring alone and occasional feedback from primary care for providers. What they found was after 12 months, systolic blood pressure had dropped from baseline um, uh, to one year, almost 15 millimeters of mercury in the dual intervention group. Remember, that's home blood pressure telemonitoring plus telephone-based lifestyle counseling compared to just telemonitoring alone and monthly feedback to the primary care providers. This is a very significant difference, 15 versus um, uh, almost six, and could potentially translate to, to a 20% decrease in stroke deaths and a 34% uh, 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 lower incidence of recurrent strokes. We are conducting uh, the PACETER trial in South Carolina, the buckle of the stroke belt, this time looking at a population of uh, rural dwellers and uh, it's enriched for African-American patients as well. This time testing the efficacy of a Bluetooth electronic pill tray, a pill tray that allow, reminds the patient about when they're taking their medication, allows us remotely to uh, uh, know when, when and if they're taking their medications and to remind them to do so, and also to send them personalized messages. So we're doing that in one arm, the intervention arm, and then we have a standard care arm. We're aiming for 200 patients. We've recruited about a quarter so far so please stay tuned for the results of that particular trial. And then finally, the issue of policy. I just wanted to underscore for those of you who might not be aware, um, uh, in 2020, this Clinical Treatment Act was passed. The reason why it was passed was because Medicaid was the only major payer that was not required by federal law to provide coverage of routine costs for participation in a clinical trial. And um, so this law was passed in um, 2020. It went into effect January 1 this year. But the great news is that it now requires Medicare to cover um, all its beneficiary, beneficiaries. Over 42 million beneficiaries will have the routine clinical care costs of patients associated with participation in clinical trials. This is huge because many of the racial and ethnic minority uh, 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 individuals at higher risk for stroke many times fall into uh, the Medicaid category. So this hopefully will allow uh, the removal of many barriers to participation for many patients who fall into these categories. I want to thank you again for your kind audience and to the AHA Western folks for the opportunity to do this. Thank you so much and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you for your insights, Bruce. Closing equity gaps in stroke care is vitally important to our mission and it's really our charge. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our team from the Queens Medical Center, Dr. Kasuma Nakagawa, Danae Jones, and Jen Moran. Dr. Nakagawa is a neurointensivist and neurologist who serves as the medical director of the Comprehensive Stroke Center and the neurocritical care at the Queens Medical Center. Danae Jones is a stroke certified registered nurse and serves as the interim stroke coordinator for Queens, while Jen Moran, who is an advanced practice registered nurse, serves as the interim director of neuroscience at Queens. Please join me in welcoming the team who will share how they're innovating with Get With the Guidelines to Improve Stroke Care. Hi guys, I'm Danae. I don't see those slides coming up, but then Jen Moran's here. She's been our stroke coordinator for the last seven years. So we're gonna talk about expediting stroke care um, for Queens Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I wanna kind of show you the lay of the land here. Our state um, you know, is made up of different islands and these are all the thrombolytic ready sites. There's about 18 of them and um, Queens Medical Center covers 10 of them through telestroke or in person. So these are the 10 sites that we cover and then Queens Medical Center in Honolulu um, is the only comprehensive stroke center in the islands. Next slide. So back in October, 2019, um, the transportation guidelines 
went through to bypass any stroke ready hospital um, for any LVO patients that were lapse positive and CSTAT positive in order to go straight to the thrombectomy center. And if you see on the next slide, that Queens Medical Center Punch Bowl is the only thrombectomy um, center in the islands. So they would have to come to us. Next slide. And then in December 2021, the telehealth team with Dr. Koenig and Dr. Hoyetska, they worked with city and county EMS um, to include this extra step for them where they call us, they call the ED charge nurse and provide the name and date of birth while they're en route. This way the, the doctors can look the patient information up in the chart ahead of time. And it's also HIPAA compliant. Next slide. And I just wanna shout out to um, you know our nurses here, Tina and Susan. They're our clinical research nurse and clinical coordinator, and they really keep us on track for our get with the guidelines and help us, you know, push to strive to meet these quality metrics and provide the best care for our patients. Next slide. So here is a case study that happened on April 3rd. We had um, a man was at home with his wife reading. He had sudden onset of hemiplegia at 1430. EMS was activated immediately. So we say, yay, good, community recognition. Um, the wife recognized, you know, something was happening, probably a stroke, called EMS right away. EMS went on scene and um, in route, they were able to notify us ahead of time. So this is a pre-hospital activation that they sus suspected a stroke. So our stroke code went off at 1502. This is six minutes prior to arrival. Our stroke team was downstairs in the ED at 15.04, and um, this gave them four minutes to look the patient up in the chart and see if there were any records to see, you know, what what's the history of this patient. And also sometimes in that four minutes, we call a family to get the story. So they arrived at our doors at 15.08. City and county um, bypassed two hospitals. This added about one minute or less and, you know, brought them to the correct site where we have more thrombectomy ready because you can see that this patient on their perfusion study is having an LVO. We were able to give uh, the IV thrombolytic within 13 minutes of door to needle, a door to needle time of 13 minutes, and then at 1620 door to puncture time and 1631 reperfusion with a tiki 2 b score. So. All in all, this patient had the sudden onset at 1430 and then reperfusion at 1631, which is a two hour and one minute um, time lapse from when the stroke started into when they got both interventions to you know, prevent further damage. Next slide. So during the hospitalization, um, we, we did find out the patient had AFib and was taking a DOAC, but improperly because he could not really afford it. And so, you know, as we know, a lot of patients will either take it one day, you know, every other day or once a day. So we have have a stroke navigation, medication teaching on compliance, explaining the importance of it, and then also assisting with affordability to make sure that this is something that the patient can, um, you know, continue to afford and prevent strokes. Next slide. So all in all, this patient was, um, you know, arrived at our door at 1508 and then discharged at 10.06 two days later. So that's a 43 hour time lapse from onset or from arrival to us to discharge to home with no therapy needs because the NIH started at 13 and when he left, it was zero. You can see on this MRI scan that he had a very, very, very tiny stroke compared to what it would have been. So we see this as a really true success story. And, as you guys know, it's a team effort. Um, we have Dr. Nakagawa here and then Jen Moran. So they've been, um, you know, an integral part in making this program um, successful. And I think Dr. Nakagawa is like, you know, our fastest time to, to door to needle um, at six minutes. So it's, you know, a great team to work with. Um, each, each section knows that they have their role and they perform it well. So thank you guys very much. You know, we, we're grateful for this award. 
Thank you so much for sharing the remarkable impact that Get With the Guideline Stroke has had on the Queens Medical Center in Hawaii. And on behalf of Western States, it's my pleasure to thank our many healthcare colleagues who took time out from a busy morning to join us today. Thank you for your resounding commitment to the communities you serve and the patients you treat. And congratulations for being recognized for delivering award-winning stroke care. Additionally, we look forward to announcing the next round of 2022 awards in early summer as the 2021 data is being finalized. If you qualify for a 2022 award, you've earned it, so go ahead, flaunt it. This year's award toolkits uh, do have some new items that you can use to promote your hospital's award, including examples of pull-up banners, uh, in-hospital customizable videos, as well as ads and other materials that your hospital can use to share your accomplishments. You can reach out to your AHA ASA staff contact with any questions. They are there to help. We thank you for being here. Congratulations, and see you next year.